strange twist of fate, I wound up owning the ZOS platform installation strategy. So if you don't like what you see over the next few years or you don't like what you see here, there's my email address. You can reach me directly. I'm not really that unfriendly. We can set up time to talk if you want to, okay? So, um, but what I've, what I've done is um, over the past six years, somebody reminded me, somebody named Marna, I think, reminded me <laughs> that I've been working on this stuff for six years. I really put this together over, over a period of, of a year or two and began to implement it sort of in stealth mode because that's how we are at IBM, right? We never announce what we're doing in advance, never ever. Uh, but I have special dispensation to uh, tell you guys actually what's gonna come out over the next few years, um, even things that aren't in plan yet. So you'll see the normal legal disclaimer that you know, don't rely on this because we may not do it. Um, you know. And this is it, this is, the, this is the disclaimer, okay? Believe the disclaimer. Plans do change, but what, um, what hasn't changed is my view of the definition of installation. So if you ask six people for their definition of installation, you will now have seven opinions because none of them will probably match yours. But my definition of installation is everything you do from the time that you get a product until it is ready to process the first thing in production that needs to be processed. It's end to end. Okay, it's not just laying down the bits. It's not laying down the bits and running the IVP. It's not laying down the bits and running the IVP and, and doing the first step of the setup. It's the whole thing from end to end. And that's a challenge to address from end to end. And part of the challenge comes from a lack of infrastructure that we've had historically. And part of it comes from just the scope of the set of tasks we need to accomplish. But that's my definition. So this is definitely a journey and there are steps along the road, and I'm gonna talk about some of those as we go. But before I talk about what we're going to do, I wanna step back for a minute, since this is really a, an evolutionary kind of thing, and I wanna talk about where we've been, which I guess makes me an, a circle, right? <laughs> from, <laughs> from, the, from yesterday's keynote. Um, so I, I guess I do love to tell stories that are rooted in history, so here we go. So in the beginning, in the 1960s, if you wanted to buy software from IBM, you went to the lab that had the product that you wanted and you got it from that lab and then you went to the other lab that had the other product that you wanted and you got it from that lab. And you rinsed and repeated until you had all the products that you wanted and then you went through all the different installation procedures that all of those products had, okay? And we really assumed at that point in time that the catcher was another computer scientist right, that would understand what to do with what we threw over the wall because they understood how computers worked and they weren't really, frankly, they weren't horribly complicated back then. It's just that they were new to everybody, right? So eventually, as sometimes happens, we ran out of excuses. <laughs> so after we ran out of excuses, we said, okay, we need to have a service tool that's common. So we adapted System 360's OSMP into this thing called SMP and later SMP4 and it evolved into SMPE. And we instituted packaging rules to say when you package a product, you will do it this way. It will be SMP packaged, it will follow these rules. By the way, we have these additional recommendations. We formed this division called the Program Information Division, just in case you've ever wondered what PID stood for originally. Right, you still hear IBM, IBM people talk about PID. It hasn't existed as the name of an IBM division since, I don't know, the early to mid 1970s, but we still call it PID. I'm not quite sure why. I guess we're sort of stuck in our ways. It's like people talking about foils when they mean charts, right? Um, but anyway, we formed PID and anybody that had an IBM product that wanted to ship on what was then the MVS platform had to play by the rules in order for their product to ship to anybody outside of IBM. So this was a huge improvement, right? Um, it really was. It has a, a relatively recent analog that I won't go into, but you probably know who I'm talking about. And after that, things still stayed pretty complex. So the good news is you could install all the bits with SMPE, and the bad news is after that, if it was a system or a major subsystem product, how many people remember, I mean really remember, have coded a, a generate macro for system generation? How many, right? Weren't they fun? 
okay? So back in the MVT, MFT days, you were lucky if system generation produced something that would work. And considerable effort and frustration and time was spent in getting the thing to work after you exited the installation process. And oddly enough, after a while, you know, we, we said, well, we don't really expect computer scientists to catch this stuff anymore, but we do expect a system programmer to catch this stuff. And as time went by, we ran out of excuses again. And you know when you're, you're in trouble when your sales department steps in to fix a problem for you, okay? Sales, IBM sales stepped in and they created IPO. Not CB IPO, the original IPO. So this is batch job based tailoring and so on before there was ever the thought of having an ISPF dialogue in front of it. And what they did is they said, if people order more than one product along these boundaries, we'll put them all in one package, we'll integrate the service, we'll give people a faster way to lay down the bits. And on the back end, we'll even take care of some of that other stuff in the program directory that they called related installation materials or RIMs. And then its successor, CB, CB IPO, added custom built IPO, um, added an ISPF dialog front end to that so that you didn't have to edit variables in a batch job and so that it could remember configurations and you could model after them and so on and so on. And then eventually we came out with this thing um, called server pack and server pack retained that limitation that said that you need to order things within certain groups. So if you wanted an IMS product, IMS went along for the ride. If you wanted a MVS product, MVS went along for the ride and so on. And that restriction remained when we introduced server pack, um, but we did eventually uh, get rid of that. And then easier was still not easy. We still had a complex product structure. We shipped uh, DLIBs in CB IPO and you had to generate targets, but we started to ship the target libraries in server pack. And eventually, as luck would have it, we ran out of excuses <laughs> again, right? So this is about when server pack came out and now we shipped server pack along with OS 390 release one and I'll be quite honest, server pack had some early teething issues. And, um, and we, we dealt with those teething issues. We dealt with the quality issues. We added a bunch of function that people wanted. The ability to automatically assign data sets to volumes, the ability to, to display lists of data sets by a, a certain characteristic to make it easier to migrate from point A to point B, um, internet delivery, all of those things came along in server pack. And we finally got rid of that base product requirement and a thing called product server pack that came out originally in 2013 for the MVS SREL and came out later on for the subsystem SRELs. And now we, we have um, had quite a bit of progress in that area as well. So here's kind of where we are today. Server pack is, is one of the two standard worldwide installation methods. You're probably all familiar with this menu, right? That you have to go through sequentially. You probably know that if you back up, you need to go forward again to retail the tables, right? There are some counterintuitive things in it. Um, but again, we aggregate products together so that you're processing all of the stuff for an order, not on a product by product basis. And we've integrated the service to the IBM recommended service level so you don't have to put on all of the PTFs for whatever you order, just whatever's needed to bring it up to your desired level of currency. After you're done letting it sit on the shelf and getting around to doing the installation and getting through the installation, you know, things tend to age a little bit, right? So typically people go back and put a few more PTFs on after that. And it has a pretty flexible, if kind of clunky, ISPF-based dialogue, and I can insult it because I was the guy who designed most of the externals for it for about five years. Okay, after it came out, I actually went over to server pack design to, to help out for a while. And it stores your configuration choices. It creates batch jobs based on those choices. It allows you to model after prior orders so that you don't have to do everything every time you get an order. And all of those things are pretty good things. And then there's CBPDO, everybody's favorite document. Who loves program directories? I have one, and he's an IBMer. <laughs> okay, so um, you get to read the program directory, you get to run receive, apply, accept yourself for the product FMIDs, and then you go, get to go back and do it again for all of the PTFs you need to bring it up to a service level that is actually likely to, to be the one that you want, right? 
and all of the post SMPE steps are documented in a combination of the program directory and other books that you have to go to. And Server Pack at least has taken care of the stuff in the program directory, but there are still those other books you have to go to either way. But easier is still not easy, and when you go to Shop Z, how many people have used Shop Z directly? Most of you, okay. Isn't it a great thing to pick the package you want to get something in before you can see what products you can order in that package, right? This is like going to Amazon and saying, well, you know, I want to get this by truck. It's a toothpick, but I want it to come by truck, <laughs> right? So maybe this wasn't the best thing we could have had, and this is really part of the problem. So depending on where you are in the world, in the world, you see three to six choices for ordering. And after you choose one of those, you get to display a product list of things that are available within that choice that you made. And this is really a big part of the problem I want to solve. You know, what's behind all of these doors, right? Well, we don't know until we open them. It would be kind of nice to know on the way in. And the current state of server pack is you know, pretty, pretty much, although it's advanced a little bit, pretty much the same as it's always been, product aggregation, service integration, uh, the dialogue you're all kind of familiar with. But there's no smooth segue from the end of the server pack process into product setup tasks. And once you've done the server pack installation path on whatever system you go on first, system programmer sandbox, right? Whatever system that is, we are done with you and getting it from that system to the next system is kind of up to you. And some people have really well-grooved processes to capture all the things that you need to do and to replicate them somewhere else and so on and so on, but, but from an IBM support standpoint, we're just done with you as soon as it's installed on the first system. Um, and we probably ought to you know, think about doing something there too. And the status of PDO, you know, PDO supports ordering uh, SMPE installable products, uh, as many as you want within a SREL, what, actually what's called a subsystem type by software manufacturing. Um, again, you got to read the program directory, you got to spend a lot of time in SMPE, and we have invested this much in CBPDO in about 25 years. Okay, other than keeping it breathing as necessary, we haven't touched it to make any improvements in it. That's why I have that guy in the blacksmith shop, right? It's really kind of old fashioned. And then speaking of old fashioned, there's that other package, the standalone path, right? This is the one where stuff that can't be SMPE installed goes. This is where stuff often goes right after we buy some company that, or buy a product from some company that we want to offer for ourselves. This is where some of the things go that we resell that aren't packaged in a way that allow us to flow them through software manufacturing in the current process, or they are, but we haven't gotten to it yet, um, or whatever the reason is. So this is data replication. This is, you know, it's three tapes or two CDs or whatever it is, and we're gonna make copies and we're gonna put them in a box or put them on a server to download and mail them or tell you where to download them from, and then we're done. Every installation process in the standalone path might be different. I have not, got, not gone to count them but I know there are at least two, SMP and non-SMP, and this is another part of the problem. And we're running out of excuses again. And what we hear from customers is, is you know, kind of a low rumble, I guess, that's been consistent for a long time. Um, we've heard that product license management is a pain in the neck. And I had a great conversation with a guy who's, who's uh, one of his licensing challenges was dealing with IBM's print suite. Right, so he had PSF and he had PPFA and he had a bunch of other stuff that he all had installed in his ZOS server pack. And, but he had three sites. And he didn't want to pay for the licenses for all of this stuff on all three sites because he only had a print concentrator on one of them. And all the printers were network connected and there was no good reason to pay for these products on three places when he could only pay on, on one place. And therefore, they did three server pack installations in order to break up all the products they needed. They did three full ZOS server pack installations. And he was delighted to learn that product server pack existed. At the time, the print products were not, all, all the ones he needed were not available in product server pack, but because we understood his issue and because he wasn't ordering them until later that year, we were able to get them to the top of the list and make them all available by the time he ordered the next time. So that was pretty cool. 
Um, we've heard that a lot of people were bringing new guys on board and gals, of course, right? New people were coming in to replace uh, those of us whose, whose hair is graying, right? Who were starting to look at our 401k balances and say, how long is this going to be worth it, right? And those people didn't grow up with the, the level of complexity that we have become accustomed to. And one of the analogies I use, have you ever heard the analogy about, or the thing about boiling a frog, right? And, and the story goes, you can't put a frog in boiling water, it'll jump out. But you can put it in cold water and warm it gradually and, and he won't jump out. And it turns out this is not actually true. When the frog gets uncomfortable, just like you would, he'll leave the pot, right? Um, but we have in effect boiled a generation of, of frogs because we have all grown up with this complexity. It wasn't that bad when we all started. It became gradually more complex over time. But boy, seeing it for the first time is quite a shock to, the, to a lot of systems when you get new people and it's you know, three to five years before they can be effective in most cases, right? So you know, we need to do something to, about that. And we've heard you know, other people have simplified their installation processes. Can't you guys do something? And last but far from least, whatever you do, don't do it in a vacuum. Make sure that the other software vendors um, are, are working with you on this. So here's where we want to be. So this is, this is my wish list, okay? IBM's wish is to have one way to order things. So when you go into Shop Z, what you'll see is a dropdown that has ZOS. And that tells you what platform you're interested in. And when you select that platform, you can pick whatever products you want that we have available for, the, for that platform. So no more choosing between server pack and PDO and standalone and whatever else might be available. Um, and you can select products that are in SMPE format or non-SMPE format or a mix of SMPE and non-SMPE format. And, and I'll have a little bit more about why that's happening later on. And then in ZOSMF, we've got this thing called ZOSMF Software Management. How many people have seen it? An unexpectedly good number. Good. Well, Gary doesn't count. <laughs> but um, so in ZOSMF Software Management, ZOSMF Software Management started out being called Deployment Manager, and then we renamed it when we realized we were going to do more than just deployment. But the Deployment Manager part of software management makes copies of software. And originally it did S&P installed software, but we'll get, we'll get around to that too. So in software management, we want to add some function so that you can go get your software, OK? Um, and, we want to add, and we have existing function that allows you to use the, the deployment option in software management to install the kind of package that we're talking about. And then we want to add some function to software management to call ZOSMF workflows to handle the setup tasks. So we have the infrastructure to attack the larger end-to-end -end problem. Now, there's an element here of horses and water, right? But if you don't have any water, you can't lead the horse to it, OK? So this is going to be, a, as I said before, a process. It's going to take time for everything to, to happen so that we get to a state of completion we're all willing to tolerate. Um, but that's the, the general direction, is to make ZOSMF the installer. And the other thing that's cool about workflows is we can redrive those workflows for every deployment operation. So once you go and you finish the installation on the first system and you want to go to the second system, wouldn't it be nice if we redrove those workflows so that you didn't have to keep a checklist of all of those things and we would retailer them for the target environment where we're going to so that you didn't have to do all that kind of stuff yourself. Now, there's always, as I said, there's a journey. So we have to get from point A to point B, right? And we can only start from where we are. And this particular stairwell leads from a platform at the top of a mine pit up to the surrounding terrain. Uh, but you can only start from where you are. And the thing that we have that is closest to where we want to be is server pack. So we're starting with server pack as the base. And we have to keep the things about server pack that are good. It's good to do product ag aggregation so that you can deal with installing at the package level instead of the product level. It's good to keep service integration so that you don't have to put a zillion PTFs on in order to bring it up to snuff before you're willing to put it into production. 
Um, but we did need to remove the need to order a base product. This is what created product server pack. And we, we need to work on getting the, the things that are on the you can't get it in product server pack list down to a reasonable number. I like zero, personally, as a reasonable number. And make it possible for non-SMPE products to be delivered in server pack. Because at the end of the day, the server pack production process is not actually reliant on SMPE it turns out. And the whole idea here is when you want products from IBM, you order the product sets you want, when you want, you deploy them into the environments you want, and life is reasonably good, we hope. And then there's SMPE. So one of the use cases for CBPDO is I've got, um, my, I have an existing product set with an existing set of SMPE zones and an existing set of products, and I want to order another product and I want to add it to that set. So we want to work on zone merge. Zone merge is a command that's been there, I think, since the inception of SMPE or pretty close to the inception of SMPE when it went from SMP4 to SMPE. And it sounds like it ought to do things that it did not do. So we want to work to make it actually do those things. So now when you have sysmod entries that are real and CFREC only sysmod entries and, you, and you're doing a zone merge, we're going to keep the right one. We're going to make sure the IFREX actually gets satisfied. We added a zone merge check so you can see in advance what's going to happen, right? And now we have the capability to add disparate products to an existing zone. And that came out last year, in case you didn't happen to notice. So this addresses some of the SMPE infrastructure we had to have, but not all of it. And then ZOSMF software management also needed some work. One of the things that it required was it only did SMPE installed products. So when you defined a software instance, you gave it the name of a zone, it went out to the zone, it found the DDDFs to find the data sets to automatically include in the software instance. And then it turned out after a while, we learned that some products have setup procedures that create software level dependent data sets that are adjuncts to the system software but need to travel along with it. So we added the capability to go corral those things and make them part of a software instance, but you had to start with an SMPE-based software instance. Now you could fake it out, right? You could create a fake zone that didn't have anything in it and didn't have any DDDFs, and then you could create your software instance and you could add stuff to it to have you know, a, a quasi-SMPE software instance with nothing that was SMP-managed, but we just needed to take away the requirement altogether. And one of the other reasons that we did this was now you can use system uh, software management rather to deploy any product. It doesn't matter who it's from. It doesn't matter what it's packaged with. It can be SMP. It can be non-SMP. So now we have a deployment process that supports arbitrary content, whatever you want. Um, as an interesting side note, it is easier, in my opinion, it is easier to use software management to define a software instance and do a deployment deployment than it is to construct the DSS control cards to do the same thing <laughs> for whatever that's worth. Even if you use the DSS panels, which I do, right, particularly for logical data set operations. Um, so now it can be an installer for non-SMP stuff and, and it wouldn't take uh, external packages as input, so we fixed that as well. And it wouldn't create a portable version of a software instance, which is the necessary prerequisite for making it an installer. So here's what we've done lately. So now we have SMPE agnostic software instances. You can define a software instance with arbitrary content. We have what is, in effect, a built-in SMPE agnostic software packager. And this is essential, right, if we're going if we're gonna help other software vendors and even ourselves create packages that, are, that might be packaged with or without SMPE, we need a packaging function. And this is the packaging function. And we have the capability also to take something that's been expressed in that portable format and now do a deployment with that as input. So that's our installer. That's our SMPE agnostic installer. And this provides the basis for a common installer for anyone who's willing to play along. And we also have APIs in place so that you can create a software instance programmatically and export it programmatically, right? So we're trying 
pretty hard to, to provide the tools that not only our own software manufacturing will need, but that other people who want to follow along with us can use if they choose to in order to, to create a, a process with the same output. I wouldn't suggest for a moment that anybody do software manufacturing the way we do. That's a whole nother evolutionary tale of, of how we got there. And all of this is available on ZOS 2.2 with PTFs, and it all rolls back to ZOS MF 2.1. Um, but as Gary has been at pains to point out, out, we're not going to continue to roll everything back to ZOS MF 2.1. So, um, so keep that in mind as we go. How many people get to explain things to managers often? How many people have, have, have heard the phrase similar to, Stop with all the details, just show me the big picture, right? Show me the big animal picture is, is sort of a, a East Coast phrase perhaps, but um, this is the big animal picture for creating a software instance. And you'll see on the top, we have an SMPE managed software instance and I'm creating, um, or actually an SMPE managed product set and I'm creating a software instance for that. And on the bottom, we have one that's non SMP managed and I'm creating a software instance for that. And I could equally well create a software instance with a mix of both, but when I start to put that much stuff on the screen, it gets hard to read in the back, right? And then if I wanted to export those software instances, has anybody else noticed that the latest PowerPoint doesn't have an optical media image? I was too lazy to put one together, so I used a tape. But anything that's it's portable, it could be on tape, it could be on a DVD, it could be on a CD, it could be over the network. However you want to do it, we'll create a portable image of that software instance from the metadata that we have in ZOSMF about the instance. We'll suck the stuff out of the data sets that are part of that software instance and put them in that, in that portable format, um, SMPE or non-SMP. And then having exported it and made it available to yourself, to somebody else, it doesn't matter. Now you can do a deployment using that portable software instance as input and recreate copies of those original libraries, which I've called product set one prime and product set two prime for SMPE and non-SMPE installable respectively. And again, it's not actually an or, you can, you can have both in the same one. And elsewhere, I've talked about product server pack. There are 25 unique products left on the list of things that don't have the dark triangle when you go into shop Z and look at server pack to say that they're available in product server pack. And my, drive, my job is to turn all of those blank triangles to, um, to black ones, right? Because eventually, um, we, we want to get rid of that standalone path. So 10 of those things are fonts. And so what we're going to do with the fonts, those 10 font products, and these are old font products. Frankly, nobody needs, needs these if you're not using them already. You don't need them now, right? But in order to, to remove the need to remember to order them if you are using them, and in order to get them off of my bad boy list, I'm gonna put them all into ZOS itself, and they will come out of the standalone path, and that, that leaves me 15 products to go. And I want to finish all this by the end of 2019. And you might ask, why 2019? And hold that thought for a little while. Now, in the meantime, you may or may not have noticed in the last announcement, not the preview, but the one before that, I think, that software manufacturing is going to put in the infrastructure to flow non-SMPE managed products through the server pack production process. OK? Now, when we do that, when that's done, we can take that stuff that's in the standalone path that's either SMP packaged but not according to the rules or it's not SMP packaged, and we can flow those products through server pack. And as we do that, as we make them available in the server pack offering, they'll come out of that standalone path um, ordering option. And part of the magic of the way they happened to design Shop Z is that once we get rid of the last one, that standalone option will just vanish from your screen. You'll never see it again. So we hope to make that go down from three to two in the United States as we get that done, or actually the Americas in general. And then in software management, this year and next year, we have quite a list. So to support non-SMP packaged products well, we need to have the, the, the ability to display the, con the product content of a software instance. 
So when you define a, a software instance with arbitrary content, that's great. But without SMP there, without the plus plus product, plus plus feature entries to go look at, we don't know what's in it. So we need to add some metadata, some descriptive metadata to describe these things so that we can show you what's in it. So you can see which products you've deployed where. And also because we can use that same information to drive the end of service reporting that we drive today for SMPE managed products. So part of software management is a display that says, show me if I'm losing service on anything, right? And you, you guys have seen, I'm sure, those consolidated twice a year withdraw from service announcements. And twice a year, you sit down with that and you figure out, do I have any of these products and where are they, right? And it's really convenient because you're working from this list of product numbers and what you have somewhere else is a list of FMIDs. So it can be kind of time consuming to go figure that stuff out. I used to actually have to do this, so I know. Um, but we have this cool display in software management where you can download an end of service file and we'll show you on a timeline. Hey, out here, you're gonna lose support for something. Let me drill down and see what that is, right? We wanna drive that same display for non SP managed products that we can drive for SMPE managed products. And um, we need support for downloading portable software instances in software management so that you can point somewhere and say, I want to get my software instance from there and we'll, we'll go get it for you so you don't have to download it and put it in the file system and then tell us where it is. We'll, we'll take care of some of that stuff in the background for you. And we need, as I mentioned before, to call workflows from deployment operations because workflows are what provide us the infrastructure to allow us to, to handle the things that end when we've finished moving the bits. And from that point to when you're ready to flip the switch into production, workflows are how we can handle those tasks. Doesn't mean we're gonna get them all done right away, right? But without the infrastructure, we can't do it. So all these things are still infrastructure for a bit. So what's left? Well, past 2018, um, we've put all of this stuff into a ZOS 2.2 base, even though some of it happened to roll back to ZOS MF 2.1. Going forward, it's going in a 2.2 base. Normal APAR rollup will get this stuff into later releases, right? But putting it in a 2.2 base means we can't rely on having it there until 2.2 is the lowest level driving system we care about. Right? So you guys all know the difference between a driving system and a target system, I hope. We've been saying that for 20 something years, right? The driving system is the one where you run the work to prepare a system you're actually going to use, which is the target system. So the driving system requirements uh, for ZOS 2.4, assuming we have a ZOS 2.4, assuming that it's still a version two and all of those sorts of things, right? Um, or even that we're still calling it ZOS, you never know about this stuff. Um, so when that comes out, which I anticipate uh, to happen sometime in the fourth quarter of 2019, that's the base from which we can work to actually exploit these things, right? So we can't really exploit it any time before that, at least from an IBM perspective. Some of the vendors might beat us to it, and I think that's great. But from an IBM perspective, we can't turn the whole ship fast enough to exploit this ahead of that uh, time frame anyway. Um, and then in, and also in this time frame, we need to work on acquisition of service packages and things to, to manage the installation of PTFs and software management. And possibly, and I say possibly, um, well, actually I missed one. I missed the, 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 the important one, which is to say we want to handle software instance merge for things that are mergeable, including the zone merge. And then possibly, although this one makes Kurt a little bit nervous, possibly at some future point, um, we might handle merge with replace to handle that other use case that we have for PDO where you're gonna delete something and then install a new release of it. Um, it may be, you know, we got some interesting closed door feedback on this, right? So I showed this list at a closed door session, I wanna say about three years ago um, here at SHARE. And the feedback that we got at the time was, you know, the other stuff you have on your list, that's transformative stuff. Do all that first and then get to that, right? So we've pushed it down the road to somewhere close to the end of the roadmap. And it may turn out that when we get there, we find out there isn't really a very high demand for it or maybe we'll do it a different way. So uh, that's why I say possibly and it's underlined. Oh, and I should also have mentioned on that chart, we'd love to have your input on that. I mean, as we get down the road, as you gain experience with this stuff, 
If you feel the burning need to have that and you have you know, really good reasons why you need it, uh, let us know. So to step back a little bit and summarize, right? So we now have an SMPE agnostic deployment engine and software management. We now have the ability to merge products. Uh, we don't drive that ourselves yet, but we, we intend to. Um, the ability to drive workflows from, from a deployment is something else that we have queued up. Um, everything in server pack, whether it's SMP managed or not SMP managed, is something else that we're working toward. Um, full content and end of service display support, not only for SMP managed products, but also for the other ones. A package acquisition function in software management, service acquisition and management and software management as well. So, oh, and, and the actual non manual software instance merge, the one where we'll, where we'll take care of that stuff for you. So, you know, what's left after that? Well, what's left after that is server pack. So server pack, they've been working, they've been consuming all the non-SMP managed stuff. We've emptied out the standalone path, right? What's next for server pack? Well, it's time to start to teach server pack to emit things in a portable software instance format in this time frame. So that's, that's the direction that we wanna go there. And because I still have the scars from the server pack introduction, if I have my way, and this is not a guarantee, this is just, I'm gonna try, right? If I have my way, there's gonna be a period of overlap between traditional server pack and the portable software instance format. Now, at the end of that relatively short period, we're gonna pull the old one out. So I would encourage people when it becomes available to, to go order it and really try it out, right? Because we're not gonna leave it, we're not gonna be able to, to support two installation engines for an extended period of time. Right? I'll, I'll have extreme pressure to, to, to cut over from one to the other. So um, understand that this is going to be a brief period. We're not gonna leave both of them around for years or probably even for an entire year, but long enough that, we, that we're reasonably sure that it's gonna work. And the earliest we can realistically do this is sometime early in 2020, okay? So about three years from now is the soonest we can get to this. And finally, it's gonna be about time to get rid of CBPDO, right? When we introduced CBPDO, before there were online manuals, before they came on DVD, if you ordered an MVS system back then, does anyone remember the size of the pallet that arrived, right? With all of the books and the tapes and everything else on it. So the good news is we've made a lot of that pallet go away with, with you know, books that you can read online or on your laptop. Um, but all of those tapes and things, right, we've, we've now consolidated into, in, into a single, quote, logical tape in PDO or a single download, but there's still all the program directories to fight through, all of those other things to do. Um, it really is the hard way to manage software these days, and sometimes it's just time to let go, right? Um, my brother, interestingly enough, used to build locomo steam locomotives, and, and this was true until only a few years ago, but it's a very narrow specialized market today for steam locomotives, you'll understand. And, um, and ultimately he doesn't do that anymore. So. so what about the other software vendors? So one of the things we heard loud and clear from the customers we've talked to is if IBM does this alone, it's not gonna be what we need to have, right? So for years, we've used this kind of portmanteau word or, or um, I'm not sure word is the right term, but we've, we've called coopetition the act of cooperating with our vendors or, or among ourselves while we also vigorously compete for business, right? But anyway, that said, this is, this is really unique in my IBM career. I've worked with a lot of software vendors for a long time. The level of cooperation I've seen here is is really breathtaking. Um, I think part of the reason might be that we've kept them in mind as we, as we did this, right? We tried to engage them as early as we could. We tried to make sure that we were doing things in a way that they could also leverage. And uh, we, all, we all need the same kind of tooling to get this done. We all have the same kind of basic needs here. None of this is really differentiating, differentiating value for anybody. It's just time to work on this from a platform perspective. And I actually looked this up because I've been saying a rising tide lifts all boats for years. And I never realized that it was Kennedy who made the quote famous. But anyway, we've been working all, through all of this stuff together. 
And the first things that we heard from them were, we need an SMP agnostic installer and we need it to be part of the ZOS platform, right? And we need a way to direct tasks to the right people by role because this isn't a single user system. We have separation of duties mandated by regulation and by good practice and by skill set, and we need to send things to storage administrators and network administrators and system programmers and security administrators and whoever else might be in the mix. Right? We can't just have one person able to look at this stuff. And some other stuff that uh, I'll get to a little bit later. So the discussions have been ongoing. And we actually met in person for the first time in a room a little bit bigger than this one, I think, that was actually fuller than this one, which was pretty amazing, um, at SHARE in 2015, and Marist College hosted this. So thanks to Harry Williams for helping to get the ball rolling. He's now the president and CEO of SHARE, I learned yesterday, which somehow escaped my notice. We've met in person at every subsequent SHARE. So those of you who saw me wandering the halls at Sunday, on Sunday in Atlanta and then wondering where I went, I came for that meeting and went home. Right, so that was my Atlanta share. It wasn't actually share, I didn't even have a share badge. We have weekly meetings by phone. So Becky Parchman from BMC hosted these meetings and Paul Spicer has taken over um, for the past several months. Now one of the interesting things that I did is I actually went to count the number of companies on the list of people who were invited to that meeting who have been asked, you know, who have, who have asked rather to be added to that list so they could participate. And there are 32 companies, not counting IBM, so 33 altogether on that list. 32 companies. It's like, wow. You know, when I got that number together, I, I knew there were a lot of them, but it was just a, a big number. And attendance has been pretty good. So the last call that had a web conference that I actually uh, used was on February 10th. And on that day, we had 27 people logged into the web conference. Now, this is people and not companies, but it's still a, a pretty good indication of the very strong level of participation we've been getting. So we sat down with them at SHARE, and at, um, we have technical disclosure meetings, usually about once a year, and we set aside a room to talk there and, and on the calls, and they, and they told us, these are our priority ones. And these are numbered only for ease of reference. So when I talk about number six, it is not below number two in priority. It's just number six, right? So these are all equivalently important as far as we're all concerned. And as you can see, we've been working our way down the list, not necessarily uh, in order, because again, it's not an ordered list. We have a couple of things available. We have one planned for 2018, and we have a couple other things that we need to work out when we're going to get to them. And then there's a priority two bunch as well, which likewise is not an ordered list. Okay, so the first one we have planned for 2017 and the others we have to work out the delivery of. So as you would expect, there's a little bit less green on this list than there was on the other list. And then this is the rest of the priority two bunch. And in typical IBM fashion, we did the last one first almost, right? Um, by in essence publishing the receive order interface or planning to. So vendors who want it can get it on request right now and going forward we'll, we'll actually publish it and I'm not sure, probably the SMPE reference, um, but wherever we're gonna put it. Um, and the common acquisition process for downloading software we're gonna, we're gonna get done um, in the second quarter of this year and common means you can point it at an IBM white website or you can point it at another vendor's website and you can go get your portable software instance package from there. And we had some older requirements as well. Um, oh, we, we have full, it's sometimes called CRUD support, create, read, update, delete support for software instances from a program via APIs. We have a way to programmatically export a software instance, again via an API. And we have now got the, uh, the SMP agnostic installer that's built in, even though everything that surrounds it to make it fully usable isn't done, the basics are there. So you can actually play with this today. And, uh, and last week as I was preparing for this, I actually went through the process of creating a random software instance, exporting it, and then redeploying from it. It's really not, uh, it's really not terrible. I did find a couple of usability things we're gonna go probably work on, but, um, but they're not major. So if you're wondering what the other software vendors think about this, here's a shameless plug for the next session in this room, okay, where um, we're gonna have CompuWare and CA and BMC 
um, come in as well and, and tell you what they think about all of this stuff. And my plan is to, is to play a supporting role here. They want me to give a brief overview and then I'm gonna sit down, shut up, and take direct questions and let them talk. I like to talk too much anyway, so that's probably a good thing. A Couple of other points I wanna make. So one of them is what we wanna invest in is making the easy path easier, okay? So we'll have a modern browser-based installer that's part of the operating system. We'll use workflow infrastructure to help get the setup tasks done. We'll use the same process for initial installation and for deployment into other systems in your enterprise if you choose to use it. Now that last point is important, right? So a lot of installations, particularly large ones, have well-grooved ways to distribute software across their enterprise. My full expectation is a lot of those people are going to graft that process onto the back end of the initial installation and declare victory. That's okay, right? But as we build more value into deployment and into the, into the things that we think you'll be able to do in software management, maybe someday they'll change their minds and, and actually start to use this instead of supporting their own process forever. Uh, support for all software, SMP or non-SMPE. Uh, one vendor was very direct with me a few years ago. They told me that the case, the business case for SMP packaging for them would never close. That they never expected to get a single additional customer if they underwent the expense and complexity of packaging their product in SMPE. So I think that's actually an important thing to support. Um, some accommodation for existing processes where possible, and I'll talk about that a little more in a minute, and consistency with other vendors who choose to implement this. So if we can do this the right way, and we can all do it the same way, then it won't matter where you get your software from, it'll all install the same way. And that would be really cool. And this is where, this is where we want to invest in this. What we are not going to do is invest a nickel in making the hard path any easier. And parts of it are gonna to get to be harder. So if you, if you absolutely positively, without exception, insist on doing all of the SMPE work yourself, we can't stop you from doing that, but we can make you do a deployment first, and then an accept, and then a build MCS. So the good news is deployment's pretty quick, and we've already integrated most of the service, and build MCS runs fast. Anybody ever run build MCS? It's remarkable. The first time you run it, you say, this is an SMPE thing, it can't have finished that fast. <laughs> it must have ended in error, but it's actually very, very fast. Um, so the end-to-end -end time is about the same, even though the complexity is going to go up another notch. And another example is if you absolutely positively insist on deploying things without their SMPE zones and you wanna use software management to do that, you're going to have to redefine the software instance for yourself without the SMPE zones, which you can do, and then go ahead and deploy it. Right? But if you do that, you're going to lose or at least fail to gain some of the value of the functions that we've put in that rely on having that information available to us, like the end of service displays, like the whole data compares, which we, which we understand we need to, to improve. Um, like the service displays, where do I have this PTF and where don't I have this PTF? Miss, missing fix reporting. So that if, you, if you're migrating uh, into an environment with a, a new processor or a new disk device, you wanna see do I have all the PTFs on? Um, or if I'm migrating to a new release, I wanna see do I have all the toleration and coexistence on? We have functions built in to help you with that, but they won't be helping you if you're not putting the zones out there with the software. And anything else we might do in the future too. And this always seems to raise the question, so I'm going to, to meet it head on. Well, what about SMPE? You're not gonna get rid of SMPE, are you? No, we're not. It is far too embedded in our processes. And on top of that, a lot of things really need the characteristics that SMPE provides. And if we wanted to get rid of SMPE, we would need something else that looks a lot like it, right? So as a consequence, we have no plans to get rid of SMPE in general, however, um, it's reasonable to expect that, that some IBM product owners who have products whose characteristics um, are not well suited to SMPE or that don't get any benefit from SMPE may choose to deliver products that aren't SMPP, SMPE packaged. And I think that's appropriately the product owner's decision. So, um, you know, if, if you object to that, you need to let them know, not let me know. I'm just a flat rate box. I'm going to take whatever you give me and I'm going to help it move, right? That's it. 
Um, so I would expect to see a few more from SMPE, but I wouldn't, see, I wouldn't expect to see very many change from SMPE to non-SMPE. I do expect a few, but I don't expect you to see a tidal wave of this stuff over time. So I've also talked about work, workflows. So shameless plug number two is a lab about workflows um, run by our, our own Marna Wally. Okay, so you might want to go there and play with them, see what they look like. Um, and there's a ZOSMF choose your own topic lab where you can go play if you want with software management. Now some things you know are always there. You can pick please a few of those things. I'm sure they haven't prepared DASD space to copy 17 ZOS systems around, but pick a few things and create a non-SMP portable software instance and see what happens, right? It's really not that difficult. Okay, some final thoughts. So my view of the world is this. I want to build this all into ZOS 2.2. Okay, nothing else to go get, nothing else to buy. It's just there. And I mean that not only for you, but also for the other software vendors, okay, up to the critical mass of function that we need to have, right? Doesn't mean that post 2.2 there might be some enhancements that don't roll back. I'm sure there will be. But it means the base that we need to all go forward, we're trying to get all that stuff on to 2.2. We only win if everybody wins, okay? The, the other vendors have to win. You guys have to win. This isn't, um, this isn't a game where IBM can win and everyone else can lose. We all need to win this. So we're gonna need your help with some of this stuff. So make sure we understand your requirements. And I mean requirements, not wishes, but requirements. We need to have this because, with some sound reasoning behind it, so we understand where to put it on the priority list. Um, depending on how many people need it and what the reasons are. Um, and we'd ha be happy to have your help with things like requirement generation. SHARE has a great requirements process. Get together, talk about it, vote, put them on the list, right? And we'll see if we can work our way um, through that stuff. We're gonna need your help with prioritization. Nobody is smart enough to do this all by, you know, all by ourselves. We're, we're gonna forget some things. We're gonna need your help thinking of the things we miss. We're gonna need your help with prioritization. So, uh, you know, please, by all means, get those cards and letters in motion as you see what's going on. So as a summary, a GUI-based installer for server pack, part of ZOSMF software management, browser-based. Server pack will look a lot different. Um, we'll have transmogrified all of those batch jobs that get generated into workflows, for example. Uh, support for SMP and non-SMP packages and mixed pa packages, both, or all three, I should say. We're trying to get down to one delivery method for IBM, so there's only one choice in Shop Z because it's the only way that you get them. We're going to help with installing SMPE-based service, both acquiring it and installing it. Um, and all vendors can leverage these built-in functions. Right? This isn't something we're keeping to ourselves. We're, we're working with them on this. And I don't want to lose sight of other futures. You know, there's other stuff on our list. Um, I didn't even attempt to make a comprehensive list, but who wants the ability to just take off this pesky PTF and anything else that has to come with it, right? So yeah, we, we need to think about that. Uh, we need EAV support and software management. We need some enhancements to the catalogs support and software management. We know that, right? So we'll be working on that stuff as we go. So here's just a quick functional summary. I'm not really gonna go through this. It's available in the charts. You can download the charts. Um, if you haven't done them yet and you wait a little while, I'll, I'll upload a set that's missing the typo. The typo's not important. It doesn't change any of the content, um, but at least I fixed it in time for the webcast. Um, here's the second page of that. And as always, there'll be a quiz to leave the room. You need to score 70 or better on the trademarks chart. Because we're shit. Right. Because we're shit.